Um, so my name is Eric Palmer. Um, I'm a software integration engineer with the user engagement group. Um, and I'm here today to help you make the most use of our Perlmutter system, you know, do lots of awesome things on there. So uh, I'll be talking about programming environments and compilation on Perlmutter. Um, just to kind of give you some expectations of what I'm going to go through is I'm going to cover a lot um, in not very uh, much depth. So you get a lot of examples and a taste of different things to just sort of get an idea of how things are organized so that you can go back later and find uh, the information you need. Um, and hopefully this presentation will, will be up and you can use this as a resource later. So uh, with that, I'll jump right into it. So um, let's take you back to the beginning. You have SSH'd into Perlmutter and now what? <laughs> uh, so to do cool stuff on our supercomputer, uh, you need to have cool software, right? So there's basically, for my list, I came up with four main ways of getting software onto our system. Um, one is is loading modules, which consists of pre-installed software by nurse staff. Um, another is containers, uh, which won't be part of my talk, but will show up in the following talk. Um, compiling code from source, that's what you get for, your, you know, if you do your Glit clone and you have to compile it yourself, um, that's what that is. Uh, the other one is some uh, package managers, um, some curated software lists through SPAC and E4S. So I'm mostly more or less going to follow that same order of talking about modules, talking about compiling code, and then and do some talk about SPAC and E4S. With that, let's go. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about are modules. And modules is how you load software that's already been installed by your staff. So rather than give definitions, I like to give examples. So this is my module example. Um, suppose you have logged into a Perlmutter login node, and you are looking at the version of Python. So you type Python dash dash version, you see Python 2.7, you're like, ah, oh, that's not what I want. I wanted something different. Well, again, you know, do you have to install it yourself? Turns out we have multiple versions of Python already installed in the system, and you can use modules to get to them. So the first step here is kind of to see what modules are already loaded into your environment. And that's where this module list command comes up, and it will show you what modules are currently loaded in your environment, right? You get this list. Well, this list actually doesn't include the Python module. And so we have a Python module that contains a version that's not 2.7. In this case, it's it's 3.9. Um, so if you were to type module load Python to load that Python module, when you typed module list, that module would show up as loaded here, Python 3.9. And then if you typed Python dash dash version, you would see the version of Python that you want in your environment and you'd be ready to use it to do um, your work. So that's kind of an example that gives you a brief introduction to modules and how they work for loading the software that you want into the system. We have a lot of modules on Perlmutter. Um, some of these have multiple versions. Uh, admittedly, some are more useful than others, but you know, looking through the modules is a way to, to get some software uh, that you need. Um, and I'll leave this list behind for you to look at later, but the point is not to read everything here. <laughs> um, when you log in, there's a certain set of modules by default, uh, just to give you sort of a flavor of what some of these things are doing. Uh, the first module, that KPE-x86 Milan, that kind of defines the CPU architecture. Uh, some of our other you know, modules will interact with that, or some of our other systems will interact with that to, to optimize code for our system. Uh, the ones highlighted in red have to do with the programming environment and the compiler uh, that's going to be loaded by default. Um, in this case, it's the GNU programming environment. Uh, some of these modules have to do with the GPU architecture and making settings uh, to make that work as uh, desired. Um, and there's a few others here that have to do with performance and profiling and, and such not and some other libraries that are, that are useful. So. Um, modules really cover a gambit of, of different things that happen on the system. Um, so uh, when you're going through the modules, our module system is LMOD. And you know the, the, basically, the main way to sort of navigate it is uh, through these commands in the yellow box. These are probably the most common commands you'll use for moving through 
uh, the modules. We already saw a module list to list the modules that are already loaded into your environment. Uh, if you wanted to add one, like the Python module, we did module load. You can do module load to load that. You can do module unload, followed by the, the module you want to, to unload it. Uh, module swap still works, but maybe not as popular. Uh, module show, I'll do an example of that. That shows you under the hood what the module is doing. Um, but if you want to search through the module list to find modules that you want, um, this last one here is the one that we're going to recommend. And that's why there's a picture of a spider here to scare you into remembering to search for your modules with module spider. Okay. Um, here are some cool tricks if you want to try those later. Um, but yeah. So, what I have next is an example of why you should use module spider. So, in this example, we are going to be, all right, I should, this is sort of my typing talk. So, in this example, we're going to try to load this Cray Net CDF module. I look at my module list. I see it is not there. Now I go to start looking for it. Well, I just start by naively trying to load it, and that didn't work. Sad. <laughs> uh, module shows not finding anything either. So common way to look for modules is to type module in avail. That gave me this list here. That's the one you're seeing now. Um, and we do see a version of NetCDF, but it's not the one we want. And so if I type module spider, now I see the module and the, the one I want shows up. If I want to find out more information about this particular module, I have to load the full the name with the version. And that's where you get this information here. And it's telling me that, oh, if you wanted to load Cray NetCDF, we have to also load Cray HDF5 first. So uh, I do that. I load module load Cray HDF5. And then I can load Cray NetCDF. And you see both modules are loaded here. And we have success. I know that was really quick. Uh, but basically, what that's showing you is that module spider will find your modules wherever they are. Um, there's a bit of a hierarchy, which sometimes one module depends on another. So if you're using a module avail, they won't show up there. So module spider will find those for you anyways. So module spider. Next thing I wanted to quickly show you is what a module is doing when you load it. Um, so modules essentially modify your environment in different ways. So again, this, this slide is not for you to read everything here. I've highlighted this set of commands, uh, the module commands that show when you type this module show create HD5. So this, if I were to load the create HD5 module, this is the things that it would do. This is yellow and green. Red is sort of information for the module file, so the help and the stuff about the release, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yellow are things where it's modifying your paths. Um, where things are looking for executables and libraries. Uh, green are, are modifying environment variables, which you know may come in if you're trying to build something that depends on KHD5, you might be looking for those environment variables to find the software. So you know, modules have a fair amount that they do under the hood, um, essentially helpful. Uh, sometimes if you're trying to troubleshoot things or, or look to figure out why something's not working exactly the way you want, um, module show can help you uh, do that. Okay, that was modules. <laughs> now I'm going to talk about uh, configuring compilers and libraries to compile your codes. So um, first, we're going to try to relate this to kind of what you might normally do at home on your laptop, right? So that's this first box here. So let's suppose you're just doing GCC because that's the, you know, the one that came with your system and the one you prefer to use, and you're doing you're compiling your Hello World code, and it looks just like this, you know, perhaps. You're not doing anything fancy. It's not MPI enabled. It's just uh, basic DIY code. That's what your compile line might look like. Well, uh, from there, we move up to sort of fancier stuff with uh, maybe you're now trying to uh, run your code on a cluster, and you want to run across multiple nodes. So you need MPI communication. Well, instead of using GCC, you have sort of graduated to MPI CC. And MPI CC is a compiler wrapper, which includes um, MPI libraries to enable MPI communication in your code. So, so there's kind of more things wrapped into this command than, than is kind of shown just here. And I want you to kind of equate that kind of step from here to here to another step for when you come onto Perlmutter. Now, Perlmutter is also going to use a compiler wrapper. Our wrappers, we're gonna, I'm going to call them HPE or Cray compiler wrappers. Um, and they're going to be you know, CC, CC, or FTN. And they're going to look like this here. 
but they're going to work in conjunction with the programming environment modules to configure just like MPICC did things with your MPI libraries. We're going to configure, you know, configure the correct MPI library optimizations and all sorts of stuff based off the conjunction between this programming environment that's loaded by your module and the compiler wrapper you're using. So to appreciate that, I will tell you about this fancy command, which basically shows you all the details of what the compiler wrapper is doing when you use it to compile something. So again, I'm still compiling my hello world code. I'm using my compiler wrapper, um, but I'm giving it this comp compile flag, this dash create EP dash verbose. And when I do that, it will output the entire compile line. And so you can see here in this one, the CC under the cover is calling GCC. It's giving GCC a bunch of compiler optimizations. It's compiling my code, hello world.c, but it's also including the MPI library that's correctly configured for the GCC compiler. It's also concluding the science libraries that go with that GCC compiler and, and many other uh, optimizations and, and necessary things um, that help your code run directly on a machine. This is the full list again. Don't try to read it all now, <laughs> uh, but just to show you a lot is being included under that whole CC command there. How do these kind of work in conjunction with the programming environment modules? Um, well, so if I started with the NVIDIA programming environment loaded with module load program NVIDIA, NVIDIA uh, and I did that same CC dash E verbose hello world line, this line here is not gonna change. Instead of getting the GCC compiler now, I would get the compiler that's associated with this programming environment. And that just happens to be the NVC compiler. The optimizations that are given to that compiler have different flags. They're all changed and optimized for that compiler. Same thing with the MPI library, same thing with all the other long list of stuff. Those are all tailored to that exact compiler to make sure you get optimal performance. Now let's say instead of the NVIDIA compiler, I now want to try the Intel compiler. Well, I can do module load program environment, Intel. And I can then use the exact same compile command, and it will go to the uh, Intel C compiler, ICX. It will change all those optimizations for the Intel compiler. And again, MPI libraries, all of those things coordinated along the lines with those, the Intel compiler there. We have quite a few programming environments that you can try out. Um, this is not the entire list. If you want to find out more about the other ones, I suggest clicking on this link. Um, I have to pick four out of nowhere, so I pick these four. Um, my sort of general advice is, is start with the first one here and, and give that a try. Um, and then if you know you need Intel, you know, try Intel. If you want to try Cray, uh, try Cray. And you know, you could things. Some things may not compile with this one, but may compile with this one. It may be that this needed a flag that this one didn't need. And, and so it's kind of so on. So sometimes if you're that time to play with it, you can just try switching out the different ones and see what happens. Um, if you're compiling GPU code though, I would suggest you start with the programming environment in NVIDIA. Um, and what this table is telling you is that if you loaded the module programming environment in NVIDIA, it's going to go with the NVHPC compiler family which means that if you do the CC compiler, that's the C++ compiler, you're going to get NBC++. If you do lowercase CC, you're going to get the NVC compiler. If you did FTN for the Fortran compiler, it's going to give you NV Fortran. And the MPAI library is going to use this create and pitch. So that's going to be the same across all of these uh, programming environments. But um, you know, for all of the all of the programming environments, look at this list and for all the details. Um, so that's kind of how to use this table. This tells you if I'm in this programming environment, I type CC, I get this one. If I switch to GNU, I type CC, I'm going to get this compiler, and so on. OK, so let's keep going. Um, hopefully, I, you're being feeling convinced that when I want to compile code, I should use a Cray or an HPE wrapper to compile my code. Uh, if not, I'm going to give you more reasons right here. So there's a lot of stuff that's done under the hood that we've been talking about. Um, my list here is MPI, LAPAC, Blast, Scala Pack, and more automatically are linked. So these are the math libraries, the MPI libraries, and so on. Um, other modules, when you're loading other modules into your environment, 
uh, Croatia 5, KF 50, W, they will also be linked automatically by a compiler wrapper. So you don't have to worry about trying to figure out what are the right uh, flags to include that way. Uh, if you have questions about the mathematical math packages uh, provided by Cray and included with those Cray compiler wrappers, uh, I suggest this man, read the manual, man intro underscore libsci is a good place to start to find out more about that. Um, but compiler wrappers are doing a lot. Sometimes uh, you run a red code that comes from somewhere else, and they um, come with build systems. Um, sometimes they use uh, CMake or Auto Tools, and Auto Tools, I, I kind of, um, you know, you might think of that as just make files. I, I never learned the proper name for a long time. I just make files. But anyway, so you got CMake or Auto Tools, um, and they might be searching for specific things for your environment. And so to get them to use the compiler wrappers so you get all the amazing stuff, you may have to tell it exactly. So uh, in particular, if you see the CC, CXX, FC, this is what they typically will look for uh, for their definition of the C compiler, the C++ compiler, the Fortran compiler. You may have to specifically tell it for that CC command, you're, you want to use the lowercase CC. For the CXX command, you want to use the uppercase CC. And for the FC command, you want to use our FTN compiler wrapper. And so typically, if you're dealing with CMake, you're looking at this kind of a line. Uh, if you're doing auto tools, the configure, make, make install um, process, you can um, tell the configure step which compiler wrappers to use with a line like this. Okay. Um, practical example, uh, the other day, I was trying to install this code called Slate. Uh, I was reading the install make. Um, Markdown file, um, you know, hint for compiling, read the install directions. <laughs> uh, always helpful. Uh, but when I was going through it, I saw these. I saw when I'm creating my make file, I want to say CXX is equal to MPI CXX. That's telling me I definitely need to do something about this because if it compiles looking for MPI CXX, it's not going to you know, it may or may not compile. If it does compile, it's probably not going to work correctly, but it's probably not even going to compile. So I know when I do this build, I'm going to have to put, make this make that ink file. And for CXX, I'm going to have to tell it equals CC. For FC, I'm going to have to tell it FC equals FDN. And the MPI is already built into our wrapper. So we don't have to do anything special uh, for that. So that, I wanted to, to show you that uh, real, real world example. Uh, two more quick comments about um, compiling. Uh, so a lot of the modules, when you load them into your environment, uh, they will modify this library path so that they can find those libraries when you're doing the compiling. So you don't have to necessarily specify the location every single time. Uh, but not all of them do that. Some of them do, some of them don't. Um, by default, Cray will build dynamically linked executables, which means like uh, it will try to link to those libraries dynamically uh, when it makes your executable. Uh, to avoid that, people have done this dash static flag. Um, or try to use this Cray flag, uh, these can fail on Perlmutter and they're, they're not supported. So you should expect everything to be a dynamically linked library uh, and, and to work from there. So um, with that, uh, the next section, I'm gonna kind of go into several examples of compiling code. And uh, just to, to quickly note is, I'm kind of sort of giving you a breadth of, of different things to kind of quickly look at. They seem kind of simple, uh, but because we're using the compiler wrappers, it makes things pretty easy for us. Um, so you're going to see a lot of benefits uh, coming out of that. So the example code I'm going to start with is, is really a hello world code. Um, again, you know, don't try to read every line right now. But the gist of it is, is that it's going to say hello world from either every NPI process or either, either uh, each OMP thread. So. It just gives you a sense to check if your MP processes and threading are, are, are working correctly. Um, one thing to point out on Perlmutter is OpenMP is not enabled by default. Um, if you're coming from Cori, uh, that is a change. Um, but you need to include the flag dash F OpenMP if you want OpenMP threading for your CPU codes. Um, and if you can also do GPU offload with the NVIDIA program environment using this flag here. So we'll see that in the examples. All right, so this is compiling that code I showed you before, the threaded hello world. Um, and what we're doing is we're going to, 
well, I won't talk for myself, I'll let myself talk. Uh, so we're gonna compile with MPI and OpenMP. So this is my the Hello Hybrid code. Uh, just checking our modules to see what we're, we've got going on. I think you can see we're in the programming environment GNU here. Um, I don't need anything else special at this point. I just need to include my OpenMP flag and compile like so. We compiled, no errors. I'm gonna set some environment variables to set up my, my OpenMP threading. That's what I'm doing here. Um, and then I'm going to run this with four MPI processes um, and two, but I set the threads earlier. And now you see it saying hello from each thread from each, and from each process. So we can see that this is working the way we want it to. Um, and just, you know, because the way this image plays, the compile line is here. Um, so you don't have to watch the video over and over again. <clears throat> Now, um, there are some fancy capabilities with some of these compilers. For in particular, um, the NVIDIA compiler can do uh, GPU offloading of that threading. So it will do the threading on the GPUs instead of on the, the CPUs. So that's what this example is going to show you here. So I get the same Hello Hybrid C. Um, and this time, I've loaded the NVIDIA programming environment. Right. And then instead of using OpenMP, F OpenMP flag and using dash MP GPU, this M info flag is going to tell you which parts of your code it's going to do uh, change into the GPU code to run threaded. Um, that's why you see this 18 pound OMP parallel here. Um, and, you know, setting my mind variables, again, running with four processes to an on one GPU, you see I get the same uh, type of threaded performance that I was looking for. So that's another quick example. In the next example, uh, I'm going to compile a code with CUDA aware MPI. Um, to do CUDA aware MPI, this is enabled by default, right? We've got, like we mentioned before, the GPU module will be loaded by default when you when you log on. Um, however, to get this capability, you want to make sure that this is enabled because loading this module will also set this environment variable to one, which will tell the compilers and whatnot to to do uh, CUDA aware. MPI when it compiles your code. So um, this example, I have sort of, uh, I just pulled a random CUDA vector code, vector add code to, to compile and, and give an example. Um, so. We've got my source code here, again, um, because I'm doing stuff with CUDA, I'm using the NVIDIA programming environment. I've also got my GPU my module loaded here. This is just kind of reiterating what we pointed out in the other slide. This is my compile line, right? Notice I'm um, feeding it the vector add CPU, the kernel CU, and uh, linking the HW oak library. All right, output is this vector add. And here we see that um, we're running across multiple GPUs uh, with our MPI processes um, the way we expected for Udo where MPI. So, um, again, like I said, maybe these examples are not kind of earth shattering, but the point is that. We have things configured on our system with the computer compiler wrappers, which make a lot of these capabilities much easier for you uh, when you're compiling your code. Uh, this is just a quick slide to, for people who are interested in OpenACC. Again, it's, it's a simple code, this helloacc.c, just showing that to compile OpenACC code, just dash, dash ACC out, hello code. And again, this is because our environment is set up with the GPU module that makes this part easy. Yeah. Um, so for this section, the, the last kind of example I have is just slightly more complex in that it's requiring um, some libraries that you need to specify. And you know, the difference between this and something much more complicated is you just sort of like iterate on these type of like number of libraries needed or number of how long your compile line gets for the compile code. <laughs> so um, hopefully I'm not 
bore you to death with simple examples here. So, um, so here I tried to compile my hyper code. My code uses hyper, um, but it turns out I needed uh, some files or libraries that that weren't included uh, when I tried to compile it the first time. So in this case, uh, for hyper, I, I already downloaded the package and installed it. So just to make things convenient, I'm going to store the location in an environmental variable so I don't have to type it out multiple times. So that's what's happening at this step in the example. I'm storing that location as hyper underscore DIR. So now I'm giving it the includes using my environment variable. Oh, playing the include directory. I'm telling it the way to find the libraries. And then I'm linking the hyperlibrary and compiling. No errors. Hey, it came out. Now I can test it. I'm running here, and it works. So, um, you know, Compiling code is difficult. It can go in wrong in like a million different ways. Um, and the fixes are not always straightforward and easy. But but hopefully with this set of examples, you get kind of a base set of ideas. Start with the compiler wrappers and, and add on as you, you need from there. Um, we have a lot of resources at NERSC for compiling code. Um, you know, these links are provided here about compiling and building software. I really like this page on base compilers. It has a lot of like, Using this compiler, you get this error. Make sure you add this little thing to make it work, you know, or, or remember this little trick for each compiler and each system for dealing with different things. Um, one, one thing, just um, side note, uh, you know, sometimes when you're trying to compile Fortran code, it will complain about, you know, the size of integers. The, that That is explained here, and the, the flags that you need to fix that problem when you're doing your compiles are also explained here on this page. So again, that's why I put the star next to this one. Um, we have more docs to explain compiler wrappers and, and all the things that are going on there. So so hopefully if hopefully you're intrigued by this presentation and uh, want to learn more or so yeah. Okay, so that's was sort of my my short example for for compiling software. So now I'm going to talk about getting software out of SPAC and E4S. Um, and this is kind of yeah. So um, what is SPAC? Uh, SPAC is a, a package manager for supercomputers. Um, for us, it's it's sort of a way to 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 access uh, more software. Um, going along with SPAC is the extreme scale scientific software stack, and this is essentially a collection, a curated list of software packages that have to. Uh, agree to certain principles in the development. And they also get sort of additional support uh, and testing to make sure that they work on, on our systems. Um, you know, disclaimer for, for SPAC and E4S, uh, when things work, it's really easy. <laughs> uh, when things don't, when things aren't easy, uh, they can be kind of difficult. So kind of fall either way. Um, but uh, I, I want to tell you about it because when they work, they can really be helpful. So we've got several modules here, and this is the way you access these software stacks. So to get to just the pure SPAC stack, you can do module load SPAC, and it'll give you this version of SPAC. I'm sorry, the command's over here. And right now we have 532 packages installed. So that means you don't even have to sort of go through the install process. But SPAC has access to 6,752 addition, you know, packages that it could potentially install. So if you don't, if you find one of these 532 isn't what you actually wanted, then you can use SPAC to install maybe one of those other ones. So you can install more. E4S is again that curated stack. Uh, right now, our default default version is 2211, so that's why I say you only need to module load E4S. And there's 531 installed packages there. Um, the newer version, these versions get uh, new versions get released, and old versions get retired. Uh, on a pretty good cadence. So, so be aware of that using uh, these. Um, for 2305, we have 680 packages installed right now. Um, and you know, again, I'm giving you a very brief introduction, but to find more, you can look here. This is the blinding list. Again, don't try to read all of this, but 
these are a lot of the packages that are installed uh, with SPAC at the moment. These are a bunch of packages that are installed for uh, E4S at the moment. And again, you know, some of these will be more useful for you. Some of these might be less useful, but but they're there when you need them. Um, and when they work, it can be pretty easy. So it's useful. Um, <clears throat> this table kind of gives you the, the path to follow if you want to use uh, or load one of these packages. So whether you're using the module load SPAC or module load E4S, you kind of have to go down these lists. So on this left, um, this is assuming that that package is already installed. So uh, for step one, and I have to point out here that step one is only needed for the E4S modules, not for the SPAC module. So on the E4S module, you have to say SPAC environment activate environment. In this case, it might be GCC, might be the Cray environment, CCE, might be NVHPC. There's a few different environments and it'll tell you about them. Um, so I do that first. If I wanted to load a package that's already installed, I can do spac find v to see a list of packages. And then I just type spac load that package and it'll bring that into my environment. If you want to find out, just like with module show, what it's doing to your environment as it does that, you can do the spac load dash dash hh and that will show you what it's doing. Now, if you find that it's not in that list and you actually have to install it, well, then you end up in this other um, column here where you list the packages. These are the packages that are available to install. You'll get a lot of them, some 6,700. Um, you can find out more info about this particular package, including what kind of compile options you want. Sometimes two dimensions, three dimensions, sometimes you know, uh, with MPI, without MPI, uh, with HDFI, without HDFI, all those kind of variations are, are uh, spelled out with the spec info. Once you figure out exactly what you want, you type spec install, and then that will install the package. Again, if it succeeds, great, you're awesome, it was easy. If it fails, that can be difficult to troubleshoot. Um, but, you know, reach out for help and we'll always help you. And then spac load. Um, if it installed successfully, you can spac load to load into your environment. So what I have next is a, another one of these uh, examples. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm, I'm compiling a code that depends on the library and in particular, I want to pretend I'm pretending in this example that it compiles is that it has to be 2.7.1, uh, which is available through the E4 stack. So I'm going to use, I'm going to try to compile this code that that requires my my GSL version 2.7.1. And we're going to kind of go through all the steps of, of this process. And uh, you know, it spoiler alert, uh may get a little bumpy towards the end, but So this is just this is just me typing out what I just said. I'm gonna compile this code. Uh, it depends on a version of GSL that that is available in the E4S stack. So so I'm. I'm this is the process of checking to see if that, and you know, I, I look at these all the time, so I knew it was there. But so if you were going through this process, you would do module load E4S. This is a little, what would happen when you do that? You'd see the screen, it kind of tells you how to use this. Um, because I'm planning to compile with the program environment GNU, and I'm going to use the GCC compiler, I know um, I'm going to tell it to do the GCC environment. Sorry, the GCC SPAC environment. So now I'm going to do SPAC environment activate GCC. Now, when I type my, when I search for the packages, uh, oh, this is just, this is just showing the, that I'm in the GCC environment. Ignore the person typing on the screen. You are in the GCC environment. Now, SPAC find GSL V. So this is me searching for that GSL uh, version 2.7.1. Um, SPAC find gives you quite a bit of output, but the important output is going to be at the bottom where it says installed packages and it says GSL at 2.7.1. It's exactly the version I wanted. Um, now I'm going to use it to compile my code, hopefully. The other me did a good job of this. Oh, yes. Um, so GSL is a library I'm going to compile my code against, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this uh, spec command to find the location of those libraries. 
since that package is already installed. So uh, I'm also going to store that same thing as a variable similar to what we did before. And that is the, the, the shell commands to do that. So I'm going to store the output of spac location dash i gsl 2.71 inside the variable gsl root. Now this is showing you what's inside GSL root. You can see it's that path. So I want to use it. I used it with the uh, the money symbol in front of it. You can see I can check and see what's inside that folder now. Um, thank you. So uh, now I'm going to write the compile line. So that's my code. I'm trying to compile the GSL. I'm going to include the includes in this GSL root here. I'm going to include the libraries in a similar fashion. I'm going to link them, link the libraries to me, link the output. It compiles, no problems. Cool. All right, there's my executable. I'm going to try to run it. Oh, I'm spoiling it. Um, I'm going to get an error. Oh my gosh, what's wrong? Well, the error message actually told me in this case that it's looking for those libraries, the ones that link the GSL and that, well, it stopped the GSL, but it's also looking for the GSL C blast. I need to tell it where to find those libraries since they're linked dynamically. Uh, one way to check to show that it's looking for those libraries and not finding them is with the LDD command. Um, and this is where I say, notice it says here at the top, is not found and not found. So that tells me I need to add uh, the location of those to my LD library path, which is what I'm going to do in the next step. Right? I'm going to add that directory of where those libraries were right here. Again, using that variable, prepending the library path, the LD library path here. I'm going to run my code. Try again, and it works. Yay. <laughs> so that might have been a little rough, but it, it gives you an idea of like, now you know if you need a package and it's in SPAC, you can, this is how you can uh, compile your code against that, that package that you need. Um, I realized, you know, I. The whole thing with the not finding the dynamic libraries it needed, these are the kind of little things that come up when you're compiling all the time. So, so I like this example because it can show you how to um, overcome that error too if you get that whenever you're compiling. So um, let me go on to the next slide. Um, so let me just kind of summarize now. Uh, so my key suggestions here uh, for modules, what you want to remember is when you're looking for your modules, uh, use module spider. Um, that's kind of the main command you'll use to search for modules and to do what you want. Um, I know you will never forget module load and unload. Um, the second suggestion is, uh, I hope I convinced you to use the compiler wrappers, CC, CC, and FTN. Um, and especially using them in conjunction with the programming environment modules does a lot of important things. Um, a lot of times when I get tickets about code not compiling, the first thing I do is change it to the compiler wrappers and then things start uh, functioning and working. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out here is that we do have additional software available with SPAC and E4S. And like I said, uh, you know, sometimes they can be very, very helpful, like in the example you, you just saw. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to stop here um, and um, get ready to hand it off to the next person. So, so thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, if you want to look, here's some more links to some of the topics I covered. Um, and um, you know, if you, as always, if you ever need more help, you know, you can, you can submit a ticket and I'm a consultant. So I answer those too. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah.